Hey, good morning and welcome to Breakthrough Walls. I'm Ken Walls and I'm your host and I have a really special guest on today. Somebody that was introduced to me by my buddy, Bob Donnell. I want to bring my new friend, Kasim Osgood on. Kasim, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Ken. Appreciate and it. I'm excited. I can't believe that you're here, man. This is awesome. Um, I guess this is one of the blessings of this um, lockdown is people don't have anything else to do but get on my show. Definitely. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm here to entertain the masses. Uh, hopefully bring some smiles to some, some people's faces uh, during these crazy times. It is a crazy time, man. So, so you and I were talking a little bit before we got on here, and um, you played in the NFL for for twelve years, and that's that's incredible. We're we're going to cover that, but I, I I read that you were like three or four time Pro Bowler, uh, three time Pro Bowler. Wow, man. Yeah, it's crazy. I actually missed the first Pro Bowl. I, I tore my pec tendon uh, in two thousand four playing the uh, Raiders. And uh, I was slated to go to the Pro Bowl that year too, but I missed out because I was injured. Wow, yeah. that's insane, man! So, so why don't we start out with you know? I told you I, I created this to help help people have a breakthrough and and get unstuck in life. And you know, we all go through crap in life. And 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 by the way, there's going to be times when I do this and you're on screen by yourself. Just just I forgot to tell you that. I'm so. not I'm not alone. I'm on screen by myself. I'm, yeah, I'm still here. I'm still here. So so um, you know, let's start with you know where where were you born and raised? Uh, I was uh, 1980. Uh, actually, you know, I was born two days after Mount St. Helens erupted. So I think the world was getting prepared for me to come into it, uh, shake it up by storm. But I was I was born in uh, Boston, Massachusetts in uh, 1980, and uh, we lived there four years uh, before my mom separated from my dad, and we moved to California. And actually, uh, I think mean, the first trial was uh, 1984. We're taking a Greyhound bus from Boston to Seaside, California, because uh, we were going to stay with my uncle, who was stationed at Fort Ord at the time on the military base there. And uh, I remember I had my little uh, my little GI Joe uh, little toys. Yeah. And I forgot one of them on the bus. And I remember that my brother had an extra one. And he told me, he says, I'm going to give you this one. But if you lose this one, not only are you going to be sad about losing this toy, but I'm going to kick your butt. <laughs> so I was, I was the youngest of three boys at the time. So I'm, that was a, it was a double fold. I had to deal with the world and to deal with my siblings too. But um, right. uh, they, were, they, were, they were good mentors growing up. They, they showed me the, the tough way to grow up. But um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I'm growing up in uh, Salinas, California, when my mother got remarried. Uh, my father, my stepfather, was a correctional officer at the uh, state prison there. Wow. So, we, you know, needless to say, we grew up with uh, not only the uh, military style but also the uh, the prison style. So it was very structured, rigid. Uh, I learned a lot about cleaning. I think cleaning became one of my my favorite pastimes, or it was forced yeah. to be a favorite pastime. But I mean, looking back on it now, was, I'm very appreciative of the. Uh, the skills that I was given on how to, how to stay uh, clean. So they say clean cleanliness is next to godliness. So amen. That was a good thing. It is. It is. Yeah. I'm I'm obsessed with that myself. Like, and yeah. it, it was from my upbringing too, right? So I can't. Uh, I can't take raise kids, man. It's that four inch fold in that that bed cover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Love that, man. So so um, I mean, so your father, your real father, stayed in Boston. Uh, yes. Yeah. He actually, uh, he was a, uh, state, a Rhode Island state trooper. Uh, so he actually stayed back. They actually moved to Rhode Island when we left. Wow. And, uh, he became a state trooper out there. Uh, he passed away a couple of years ago, but, um, wow. I, I know, uh, growing up was, uh, it, it was, uh, not too crazy. My, my mom did a really good job of uh, sheltering us from the craziness. Uh, we grew up in a, a pretty, pretty rough gang uh, neighborhood. So I remember back, looking back on, um, as an adult, I look back on childhood and I asked my mom, I said, how come you were always grounded? I said, well, you weren't really grounded, but I just had to make excuses to keep you in the house because there's a lot of bad elements outside that I didn't really want to get you guys exposed to. So um, she kind of kept us close to, to the wing, um, like a mother duck uh, kind of style. But That's I really awesome. got into, I got into um, just learning. I was a huge fan of, of learning. So um, I was always trying to maintain a, a straight A grade point average. I was always trying to outdo myself, uh, a little bit of a nerd. I uh, just had a, a thirst for knowledge. And we had an encyclopedia set, the Encyclopedia Britannica growing up. And I remember just picking random encyclopedias every day and just writing down everything I wrote. I would just rewrite it and wow. pictures and try to, try to learn and figure out ways because I know that 
uh, was 12 years old, I told my mom, I'm going to buy you a house when I get to the NFL. And um, I signed the autograph on a piece of paper. And I said, someday you're going to be able to cash this in and, and buy a house. Wow. My mom was like, well, it doesn't really work like that. You're actually going to have to do the work and get the money. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, I just I had aspirations at a young age that I needed to. Uh, you were something. 12 and knew you were going to the NFL? It was, uh, I remember I was 11 years old. My mom said I was too small and skinny to play football, tackle football. So she signed me up for flag football that year. And then I remember my older brother got to play uh, tackle football. And I, I told my mom, I says, next year I'm going to play tackle football or or else. That's just it. I have to play it. She said, okay, but if you get hurt, don't come crying to me. I yeah. said, sure. It's like, you know, my brothers are beating me up worse than the guys on the field. At least these guys yeah. are the same age and same size and not dealing with like big, huge uh, uh, kids. So I remember 12 years old, the first year playing tackle football, I said, I'm going to go into NFL. I'm, I'm never looking back. And yeah, that was man. the goal ever since. That's incredible. So so what part of California? Were you in LA? Is that where you? Oh, in Salinas, California. It's up by uh, Monterey Bay, Central okay. Coast. Okay. Okay. Uh, John Steinbeck country. <clears throat> okay. I got you. Yeah. So, so you, um, so you never got like, I mean, you were going to school. Did you not run into some of the bad? Oh yeah. School? Yeah. Well, uh, my, my older brothers and cousins were, fortunately they were there and around and, um, they, uh, sheltered me a lot from it. You know, it was no, uh, me hanging out after school it was always, Hey, get, go to practice and go home. So I, I had not only the dad figure, but I have older brothers like right there out there saying, Hey, when you're done, you need to go home. So there was never, you wow. get to hang out with these people or and that. And um, I was super focused myself anyway. So it wasn't really like I was uh, enticed by it. Uh, mm -hmm. I knew a lot of the people that were in the gangs that were in my classroom that I would actually help tutor and study to help pass uh, classes. So it was sort of like a, a twofold. Like, I'll help you study. You leave me alone and let me do my thing. So, uh, yeah, I was fortunate to have the older siblings that watched over me uh, and also some of the other people in my classes kind of like, yeah, that's Kasim. He's the nerd. He's the football guy. He's going to NFL. So we're going to leave him alone. So I actually had a, I had a whole community kind of almost rally around me. It's almost like a I should write a movie about it. Let's talk to yeah, you know, dude. About that. You know, here's here's the crazy part is you like there's there's this stereotype of you just said nerd and NFL and those <laughs> are never used together. I mean, ever like yeah, some of the most intelligent guys in NFL are the linemen. Oh, the, that's, the quickest that's reaction awesome. times. I mean, those big guys are, are some of the most smartest guys because they have to think on the fly and yeah. react at the same time. So it's uh, they often get um, overlooked for their smarts, but uh, some, some smart football guys out there. Wow. So so you um, so at twelve years old, you knew your your you knew that your destiny was the NFL. You proclaimed it, which I love that part. I love that part. And you ended up going and you graduated high school and, and then you went to college. I know you went to um, where uh, Cal, was it? Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The funny story, um, my mom just heck bent on me being a doctor. She's like, you're, there's no way you're going to run around for a living. And I was like, that's a funny way to put it. It's actually going to play football, mom. But yeah, um, I'm going to be running around for a living in, some, in tights and in, in helmets and pads <laughs> and pleats. And um, I remember my mom telling me, she's like, okay, well, look, you go to college and study to be a doctor. And if you get to be like, play football, then you can play football. I'll allow it. But you got to get a degree first. Yeah. So I remember uh, my senior year in college, I graduated fourth in my class. And um, I won this uh, science award for uh, designing an accelerometer that could show you uh, G-force and uh, vectors for um, uh, space astronauts. And I remember when I submitted it to the, uh, the Science Academy, I won a Science and Merit Award and actually got a scholarship to go to MIT for astrophysics. What? Yeah. And my mother was super excited. She was like almost in tears, crying, saying, I love this. this is going to be so amazing. I get to see my dream. My son's going to be a doctor. And I told her, Mom, this is great. I love it. I'm very appreciative of it. But they don't have a football team. And I don't know what to tell you, but I can't, uh, can't go there. She's like, wow. do you understand when you're passing up a, a scholarship to go to MIT, an a actual academic scholarship? She's like, you're blowing your life away for nothing, for a, a hope, a dream. And wow. I knew my mom was telling me that just from like the brass tacks of her hard life growing up. She's like, you have to yeah. be practical and you have to have a backup plan and a realistic plan. And I told her, I says, I don't know what it is, but I can't shake it. There is a realistic plan that has been in my heart since day one. And I know I'm going to play in the NFL. And I said, mom, not only am I going to play in the NFL, I'm going to get my degree. And not only am I going to play in the NFL and get my degree, I'm also going to become a businessman. And wow. you'll never have to worry about money again. 
And I remember telling her that, and she's like, it's not about the money. It's about you leaving a legacy. What's your legacy? What are you gonna what are you gonna do after football? Because they say that football only lasts for a couple of years, and then you're gonna be a young man out on the street not knowing what you're gonna do next. And I told her, I said, Well, after I'm done playing football and having a good time running around for a living, I'm actually <laughs> going to become an actor and I'm gonna win an Oscar. And she says, Oh my god, here we go again. She says, you know how hard it is to become an actor, she's like, let alone you want to play football, but then next you want to become an actor and get on TV. She's like, they don't just let everybody on TV like that. I said, mom, have you seen the smile? I want to be on TV. <laughs> and she's like, I'm going to bring you back down to earth for a moment. She's like, okay, if you get your degree, you can do whatever you want. As long as you're staying active, you keep God first, then I'll support you. And my mom is one of the biggest fans. Uh, she's always been there to let me know if my head gets too big. Um, wow. Yeah, majority of my football career, she lived with me. Uh, I kept her close, uh, kept all the family close. Wow. Um, it was one of the ways to keep you from straying too far off that path is uh, keeping your, your childhood grounded and uh, focused on the life lessons uh, growing up. And, um, there, the, and, and there's, uh, I don't, do you ever watch, uh, what's the show with, uh, with The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, where he's the agent? Um, what's it called? I, I, I forget. Oh, where, Ballers. Ballers, yeah. yeah. I mean, is it is it that extreme, or is that just like TV? Uh, that's how that's a little bit of Hollywood jazz in there. Uh, yeah. For the most part, the um, the thing I had to be wary of is the people asking you to invest in certain things. Like you uh, have to be mindful of the people that are targeting you, or people that are the uh, women are trying to sabotage your career, or people just, just people always tugging you in different directions. And uh, yeah, I was, I would say it's not any. Um, it's not any different from the typical person who's uh, who's tempted and uh, people try to stray you off of your path. But yeah. um, those who have that mind focus and that support group, you know, you can you can stay the course. And I was fortunate to have a good group of people around me to keep me focused. And uh, I'd say one of the people is that once he came into my life, helped me stay focused on attaining the next goal was Bob Donnell. Uh, Bob's a, a very powerful leader. And, and he was the one that kept reminding me that you had this goal, you set the goal, let's remember your goal and keep that goal within reach. Because you know, at times throughout your career, you're like, okay, I don't know if I'm ever gonna get there. I don't know if I'm gonna transition. Uh, can I actually leave football and feel comfortable? Because that transition is pretty rough because your identity is built in football from 12 years old to 35 play, playing football. It's like, okay, now I'm not playing football, now what do I do? I can be safe and get into broadcasting and still be you know, in the football realm, but also on TV. Or I can, you know, break free from the whole persona in general, totally, and then just go go to, you know, the next next step. And uh, Bob helped me with that by introducing me to uh, Glenn Morshauer. And uh, I was telling you earlier about that. Yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah. That you know, I, I gotta I gotta back this up just a little bit, man, <clears throat> because you <laughs> you went a little fast over this, dude. You you declined an academic scholarship to MIT. Yes, <laughs> I, I I mean I I don't even know I don't even know what to say. Do you regret that ever? You ever um, regret it? No. What I do regret was that in the NFL they offer you a uh, tuition reimbursement program, which I, I I thought early on in my career I should have gone back to to MIT and sort of just get like a secondary degree because uh, astrophysics is something that I, to this day I'm still heavily intrigued in. Uh, I know my wife comes down, she's on YouTube watching uh, uh, watching the programs, talking about black holes and, and gravitational fields and gravitational waves. And and she's just looking at me like, I don't understand any of this. I'm going to be in the other room until you're done. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, it's one of the things I just, I get obsessed with it. And she's talking to me and trying to have a conversation. I'm just glued to the television looking at, supernova and, and, and cloud nebulas and things like that. And she's like, this is, I, I married a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I love that, man. So, so I've been called a nerd my whole life. So I, and in my experience, I played football in seventh and eighth grade. I was a wide receiver and, and, and my, the very last time I touched a football on in, in a game was I caught a pass in a game I'm hauling, I'm getting ready to score, and this dude comes at me twice my size, I think running about the same speed, and boom. And I, I was like, you know what? I'm out. 
I am not, I'm done. That's it. I'm not, so I realized in, in eighth grade, that's it. I'm done. Yeah. So, and, and that's the other thing, man, is, you know, you're playing because you played college football, right? Did you get yes. a scholarship? Did you go on scholarship? Uh, yes. I started out three years at Cal Poly and then um, it, it seemed like it was not. Uh, I had dreams going to NFL and I thought that I couldn't make it there by being at Cal Poly because of the co- level of competition. Yeah. To me, I, I was I was breaking records uh, at at Cal Poly, and I was like, I, I got to go up a division and play better competition in order to get to NFL. So I ended up transferring to San Diego State, and actually, uh, I was offered. I when I wanted to transfer, I put in my transfer papers, and I wanted to go to the UCLA or Oregon. And actually, Oregon offered a scholarship, so I was going to fly to Oregon uh, that day to sign the uh, the papers because in order to receive my eligibility for that year, I had to be enrolled by that day. It was the 12th yeah. day of the of the year that year. And the day I woke up was September 11th. Oh, so wow. September 11, 2001, I was supposed to fly to Oregon to sign the contract. Uh, didn't happen because all the fights were grounded and ended up talking to my coach. And he said he had a friend uh, named Ted Tolner down at San Diego State. And he says uh, they'd be very willing to give you a scholarship because your grades are, are spectacular. And if you travel down there and you like to you like the school, then they'll offer you a, a scholarship. So my brother drove up from Los Angeles to San Francisco to pick me up and then drove me down to San Diego. Wow. And when I came down there, met all the uh, guys in the team, met the coaches, um, had a good conversation with Coach Toner. And he says, you know what? These grades are spectacular. You know, it's, it's very rare that you find a guy who's such a, a good athlete, also a, a scholar athlete as well. So he's like, uh, if you want to come here to San Diego State, you're more than welcome. We'd love to have you. And um, I was on campus that day. Though well, the first day I was on campus, I was – walking to my new dorm and uh, I saw a huge crowd of people going the opposite direction of me. It was like seven o'clock at night. I was walking to my dorm and I asked uh, one of the people walking. Around, I said, Hey, where's this huge crowd going to? Said, oh, we're going to the rock church. Uh, you should come check it out. It's really cool. I said, there's a church on campus. I said, I've never heard of that before. It's like, Oh no, well, they, they don't really have a home yet. So they're actually a growing church, but uh, you should come check it out. So I ended up going, I turned around and went to the, the seven o'clock service at the rock church over at Montezuma hall at uh, San Diego State and ended up meeting uh, Pastor Miles McPherson. And Miles McPherson, it was a former San Diego Charger as well. Wow. And he, yeah, he's the pastor of his church. And uh, I'm still part of the church to this day. They've grown, they have their, their own home now in Point Loma, uh, California. <laughs> but I remember uh, when I went to the, the the service that night, he actually, I sat next to the front of the, uh, of the uh, stage and Miles actually found me out of everybody sat next to me and said, hey, how you doing? My name is Miles. Uh, and then I said, um, how you doing? I'm Kasim. Uh, I'm new here. I just got uh, transferred down here. He said, oh, great. We'd love to have you here. Uh, he said, this is a great church. What do you think about it? I said, oh, so far, it's really cool. I think everybody's really nice. Yeah. Said, oh, thanks. Well, uh, good to have you. And then as we're finishing the, the worship aspect of the church, he actually gets up and they call, oh, you know, next on stage is uh, Pastor Miles McPherson. And then he gets up and goes on stage. And I'm like, oh, wow, I guess he was the, the pastor. <laughs> Wow. And uh, yeah, uh, it was just, uh, it was great. He actually became a, a great friend and, and confidant throughout the years, uh, you know, for a lot, a lot of aspects of, of life, life lessons that he's taught me. But uh, he was another guy that out of nowhere, just, you know, I end up down in San Diego State, bumping into the pastor of the church. And then, you know, this guy was the guy that, uh, we you know, we got married at the church with me and my wife and uh, wow. got our kids baptized there. So it's, uh, it's funny how all, all, everything happened from 2011 I mean, 2001, September 11th, moving forward, it was just, you know, adversity comes and you just redirect. And you, you know, I I mean, I'm sure you believe this, that there's a lot of times, um, for example, are you kidding me? I can't go to, I can't go to Oregon now. Are you kidding me? Like, right. But that's, that's sometimes that's just, that's just God going, wait, wait a minute. Like, you know. You had I'm not saying God caused planes to crash into buildings for you. Yeah. I'm just saying that, you know, at, from what you just said, every tragedy, you can find a blessing in it. I said that the other night on a live stream. Yeah, I remember uh, I was sitting there in, in, in the house. I had my bags packed already. And I'm just staring at the TV in disbelief. One, because planes are crashing into buildings. I said, are we at war? What's going on? Yeah. I think I'm going to get enlisted. Like, you know, it was just yeah. all go through your head. Are people safe? Uh, who else is under attack? And, and I didn't know what was going on. I thought it was like, you know, the end of the world. And then after processing that information, my coach calls me and was like, hey, uh, I don't think you're going to make it to Oregon. All the fights are grounded. What do you want to do? And I remember saying, uh, for a moment there in my head, the internal clock was saying, you better find something quick. 
you know, what, what's the next plan? Take whatever you get and let's just go. And then I remember yeah. taking a moment to, to say a little prayer saying, God, if I'm not going there, then what am I doing? I don't know what to do. I think I'm, I'm kind of stuck for the first time. I was a person that loved to plan things out. I said, you know what? This is that time where he said, you're walking by faith. So I said, coach, if you got a plan, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm open, totally open. Everything is yes. Wow. Uh, whatever is whatever it is, I'll just say yes in, in advance. And he's and that's when the the, the San Diego State uh, plan just came in. He said, "Well, I have this as well." And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I mean, I was going to go to Oregon, and you have San Diego in your back pocket, which is right <laughs> down the street in California, beautiful beaches. Yeah. Let's go. A little bit nicer than Oregon. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah. Wow, man, that's freaking. That is so cool. I love hearing stories like that. So, so you go to San Diego State, um, you finish up there, and uh, and what happened from there? I, that that's when you you got into the NFL. Yeah, the, actually, I was uh, I was um, all American the year I transferred uh, to San Diego State. And wow. when you transfer up a division, there's a cherry picking rule where you uh, the, the big schools can't pull the better athletes from smaller divisions. Okay. So I actually had to sit out a whole year. So I was wow. literally what you would call on practice squad. The whole um, year gosh. as a, as an all American on practice squad. And that taught me humility, taught me patience. Uh, it, it, it helped me love the game more. Yeah. Uh, I was able to help uh, other teammates, uh, you know, study hall, focus on that, focus on my, my schooling. And that year, my grades are f- phenomenal because there was no football, no traveling. It was just studying. Right. And, <laughs> yeah. It was a, it was a, a good moment to just be still, you know, and the Bible says, you know, be still and know that I'm God. So it, it took um, a whole year for me to say, you know what? Okay, now that I've set out a year, what's next? And that next following year coming up, it just took off. Uh, me and my uh, former teammate, uh, uh, J.R. Tover, actually broke records that year. We had the most catches and uh, the most yards for uh, receiving tandem in a season. And wow. that's, still, that's still an NCAA record to this day. But, um, you know, records aside, it was just a great experience to sit a year uh, know that God had me waiting patiently, you know, studying my Bible, knowing that my time will come, having faith, uh, watching my faith grow, watching my faith manifest. And then playing that year was just, I mean, every game was just a, a blessing. It was fun. Every game was fun. Some of the games we didn't win, it was still fun just to be around the guys and the camaraderie. And then um, when I was training for the uh, the NFL, I actually, um, I didn't get drafted. It went undrafted, free agent. And wow. my, my rookie year, I was in training camp. It was August 4th, uh, 2003. I went up for a catch in practice, and uh, it was a one-handed catch. Pretty nice catch. It was fun. And I came down on my thumb and fractured my thumb. Oh. Rookie season, undrafted uh, undrafted free agent, uh, broken thumb, a receiver. Like, How do you catch the ball with a broken hand? You have a, I have a cast on my hand. And I remember it was the last preseason game of that year, uh, and you know the final cuts were coming up. And Marty Schottenheimer came up to me in a game and says, you know what? We're pretty deep at receiver. We've got David Boston. We've got Rache Caldwell. We've got Tim Dwight. Um, we've got Eric Parker. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, a, a stellar, phenomenal uh, lineup of tight ends. And Antonio Gates, who's going to be a, a Hall of Famer. Yeah. He's like, you know, it's looking pretty slim for you making this team, especially with your broken hand. You haven't been able to get out there and perform the last couple of games. So he said, I'm going to make wow. you a deal. And Marty Schottenheimer is one of the the all time. I mean, he's a historic coach. I mean, yeah, he's right, a, yeah. Schottenheimer, he's a great guy. I've heard of it. He looked me in my eyes on the sideline and says, "I love you, kid. You got a great heart, a great personality." He's like, "I need you to do me a, a favor. I need you to run down this field and cover this kickoff. And if you can cover this kickoff and make the tackle, I'll guarantee you you'll make a, a spot on this team." And I'm looking out at my broken hand, my cast, you know. Not really a, a huge uh, special team guy at the time. But I said, right. you know what? This is my dream. I will do whatever it takes to keep it going. If this is what I got to do, if this is time that this is my time to shine, that 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 you know that quintessential moment. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do it. I said, okay, I'll do it. I put my mouthpiece in. He hit me in the back of the helmet. Said, get out there and, and make it happen. That kickoff happened. I think I was the first person down there by 15 yards. Oh. I ran down. I tackled the guy on the 10 yard line and. <laughs> I mean, it was it was unreal. I, I, I wrap up the guy, I tackle them. I remember laying on my hand again. I probably refractured my hand. I don't remember. Oh, I remember man. walking to the sideline, my hand throbbing. I was just so, like, breathing hard, excited. Marty Schottenheimer comes up to me, 
And you can see the tears coming down his face. He's a Marty was a huge crier, very, very in touch. Wow. Comes up and gives me the biggest hug and says, as long as I'm the coach on this team, you'll always have a job. You'll always have a job if I'm a coach on this team. And sure enough, year in and year out, I, I was really, really focused on being a receiver because that was my passion. But I knew that special teams was just as important to, to yeah. win games, you know, that yeah. hidden field position you needed for special teams. So I made it my thing because Marty loved it, that he was his thing. So I said, you know what? Because this coach had faith in me, I'm going to make sure that he knows that his wish was never, you know, um, doesn't go in vain. So I did whatever I could on special teams uh, throughout the year. And I actually made a career on special teams uh, doing that. What And this was with what team? This is with the uh, San Diego Chargers. In, uh, okay. okay. Yeah. Wow. So, so you, it, it, at what point did you get signed though? Cause you were free. Did they sign you and bring yeah, you in? That, that after that game, uh, I made oh. the final roster. Yeah. I made the, uh, the 53 man roster. Uh, so, so you played in that game and you weren't even signed. No, um, you're, you're not uh, official until the, the 53 man roster and they had the third and final cuts at the, after the, uh, the final preseason game. Wow. Here. Yeah, so I, I yeah I, I just knew when I broke my hand and I wasn't even on the team. But then you know I went down and said, you know what, I can wrap this little hand up here and make a club and go down there and start tackling people. So yeah, and I just I just took it back to the years growing up with my brothers. Like you know, you have uh, anger and frustration. How do you make it uh, you know work to your favor? And you know right. my brothers would always tease me and pick on me here and there because uh, like I said when I was younger I was smaller back when I was younger before I had the the growth spurt. But I was you know a bit of a nerd. And my brothers knew that, so they would always like pick at me and tease me and things like that. But uh, I remember uh, the times where I would get angry and frustrated. My mom would tell me, "She's like, there's no point in sitting there and getting angry because you're only hurting yourself. You know, the energy you have in there, it could be turned around." And I remember when I was, um, I got uh, placed in elevated math classes, elevated English classes, and elevated science classes uh, in, in school. And I would get frustrated because sometimes the material was still a little difficult. You know, as a sophomore, I'm in AP physics. And um, I didn't really understand a lot of the stuff that was thrown at me at so fast of a pace. And uh, I remember uh, I was in calculus in the sophomore year as well. And it was just new to me. And I would get frustrated when I didn't get an answer right or correct. And I have to go back and check my work. My mom to tell me, so put your homework down, take a moment to pray, read your Bible first, and then go back to your homework. And you see how much easier it is. And I remember, you know, I would go through the Bible and you're reading Leviticus, you're reading Numbers. Yeah. And you're reading Chronicles. I'm like, God, this is so boring. I don't know. Like, you know, this son begot that son begot that son. And I'm getting lots <laughs> yeah, right. numbers. It's crazy. And then my mom looked at me. They see that stuff right there. It's this little convoluted. It's complex. So if you can understand that, go back to your math and see how easy that y, y equals mx plus b is. I was like, okay, <laughs> it works. I, I get it now. And, and wow. it, was, it put everything into perspective. God's like, if you put God first, then everything else will fall in line, and it'll be it'll become orderly. Man, you just gave me chills. That is so awesome. You, your mother sounds like a very wise woman. Oh, yeah. I mean, she uh, she had uh, four kids of this as a single mother. So it was um, she had a lot on her plate to deal with. And, uh, you know, looking back on it, it was uh, she had a, a, a tough, tough go at it. We you know with uh, having to work a couple jobs and take care of all the kids. And um, sometimes like she wouldn't be able to make the football games. And people like, oh, your, your parents aren't here. It's like, no, my mom's working. You know, it's not, it's not a big deal. I don't. I don't take offense to that. No, my mom's doing her job. I'm doing my job. And, you know, eventually our paths will cross together and we'll, she'll be able to relax and, and enjoy me watching the game uh, wow. that I love to play. Dude, that is so incredible. So you played for San Diego for how long did you play for? I was uh, seven years in San Diego. And okay. um, I actually went to Jacksonville in 2010, played uh, two years in Jacksonville. Then um, 2012, I was in Detroit. And then I finished up my career 2013, 2014 with the San Francisco 49ers. Okay. Wow. That's incredible. Who's your favorite NFL team? Oh, the Chargers. Really? Yeah. 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 I mean, it was uh it was a great bunch of guys. We had a great run. I know in the early two thousands we were winning a lot of games and uh they put together a lot a lot of great people and um I think our Bible study was the strongest uh, when I was on the Chargers. You know, we were close to Pastor Miles. He was actually our, our team chaplain. And wow. we actually, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of growth, a lot of personal growth, um, spiritual growth. Uh, learned a lot of life lessons. Um, I think it was really great. And actually, the the one place that was a leap of faith was going to San Francisco. I remember I was in Detroit. And um, at the end of the 2012 season, the coaches were, were pretty unhappy about the uh, the results of that season. So they were letting a lot of the veterans go. They were going to start over and rebuild. Yeah. But um as they had told me that they were going to move on from me, I actually won the uh, special teams player of the year award. 
So then they trying to rewind it and said, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll keep you here and we, we're going to build off of you. And I said, well, you know, I already made my decision in my spirit. I already know that, you know, Detroit's not my home. So I'm, I'm going back to California and actually uh, got offered a, a tryout with the, the Niners. So they asked me, why would you turn down a guaranteed million dollar contract with the Lions to go for a tryout and hope that you make the team in San Francisco? I said, I don't know how to explain it, but, you know, it's just twofold. One, I'm going home and two. I just want to see how my faith is. You know, I, I got a good feeling. Uh, I trust my faith, my gut, and my heart says that something's good is going to happen out in San Francisco. So I'm going to go out that way. And I actually came out that year in 2013. It was actually a good year for us in San Francisco. I actually went to the uh, NFC championship game. Wow, man. Yeah. <clears throat> That's incredible. Like, and everybody needs to hear that right now because, you know, I, you're smart. You were blessed and not everybody's blessed with intelligence on your level. <laughs> Let's just be real. And I, and I, and here's what I love about you. You're so humble. You won't e probably won't even take that, that compliment, but, but like people aren't geeked out on math. Like you are like, people don't get like that. Right. I mean, you know that. Yeah. It's, it's uh well, you know, math and science are, are, are God's favorite subjects outside of watching football. So uh, <laughs> you can you can make a lot of sense of, of stuff if you just sit down and crunch the numbers. Um, yeah. They always say that, you know, like when it comes to tax season, tax season is a good example. Yeah. People hate it. But uh, if you actually look at what taxes go to, I'm not a fan of taxes, but I do know that if you crunch the numbers, you can make sense of it more so where you're, you can, it's more easy to palate. Yeah. And um, I, I think that, you know, in, in, in life, we sort of overlooked the fact that science has been there and it's been God's fingerprint this whole time that if you can actually see around the the obstacles, you know that in the end, he's got a plan. His plan is for you to pre prevail. So even in the, coast, in the midst of this COVID-19 crisis, uh, crunch the numbers and you'll see that it's not that bad. You know, right. you, you're, you covered, um, have faith in your health, in your immune system, have faith in the, the science and the doctors and know that there are people that are out there that are actively looking for answers and solutions and no war goes on forever. There's always going to be a, a climax and an end point. And you're going to look back and say, you know, I made it through that. It wasn't that bad. You no, know, it was scary. It was rough. There was some rough patches. I didn't know if I was going to make it, but I just leaned on my faith and know that with your faith, you can continue on and persevere. And I, I think that well, this too shall pass. Amen, man. <clears throat> I love that. So, so you, you, you finished up your last two years with San Francisco um, what was the what was the last year that you played in the NFL? Uh, last year was 2014. Actually, okay. uh, I, I broke my hand um, <laughs> again. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I mean, football. It's it's a better hand than a knee. I say that. I, I, I was blessed to not have a knee injury my whole career, and uh, wow. most serious injuries. You know, a couple of broken broken finger bones here and there, but uh, that's that's part of the game. But actually, uh, I hit I hit Richard Sherman in his helmet. He was holding me a little bit in the game. For all you football fans that know that uh, they they know Richard Sherman, <laughs> I actually end up uh, punching him in his helmet and kind of cracked my hand. It was <laughs> not a good idea at the time, but kind of, kind of cracked my hand. <laughs> yeah, the human emotions kind of take over every now and then, and you don't make uh, the best decisions on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> I am privy to that shortcoming as well. I, I saw I saw a YouTube video of you. Um, literally, you were flying, man. I was waiting on that R. Kelly song to come. Oh. <laughs> you, you fly. You flew over the top of this six foot something dude, and like flipped in the air and landed and pulled his pulled him down, yeah. man. Yeah, was, that, that was. was crazy. Uh, we were in London that game, and Wembley Stadium is not built for football, and um, the grass was really soft, and the 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 kickoff before that. I was running down and I tried to shake a guy and I slipped because the, the, the mud uh, just kind of took around my feet. And I said, you have to maintain your lane so you don't open up a, a lane for the runner to go through. So I was like, this guy is six, seven, three hundred and forty 340 pounds, two guys. This is back when the wedge was still legal. And they had those big guys in front of like a wall. I said, there's yeah. no way I'm going to get through this guy. I just knew it's like, it's like the walls of Jericho. I got to sing seven times and go around and they're going to fall. <laughs> I ended up saying, you know what? I told my, the, my buddy next to me, I says, Hey, Brandon, um, you got to run straight and just stack behind me and you'll see what's going to happen. It's going to open up like the Red Sea. And you're going to go through and tackle the guy. And he's like, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going airborne. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? doesn't make any sense. The, no, what are you talking about? Don't do that. Just do, do what you're supposed to do. I said, this is what I'm supposed to do. And I remember he broke the huddle and you just came out. I was running. And I remember after the game, he told me, he said, man, you are one of the craziest people I've ever seen in my life. So I've never seen that ever in the history of football. 
I said, sometimes you just got to make do with what you got. And Dude, there's you no went way. up and it over. It was Rick crazy. Was yeah, so I ended up flying over the top of the guy. That was awesome. Wow. So my wife and daughter are watching, by the way, my nine-year-old. That, that's what she says. You're a great ro role model for kids. And oh, dude, you, you really it. are, man. So, so, so you, you got out of the NFL in 2014. Um, and I, I, you and I talked a little bit before, um, is, is that when you met Glenn or had you already met Glenn? Uh, I had already met Glenn. I think I met Glenn in 2011. Okay. okay. Yeah. It was my second season in, in Jacksonville. I was out um, on vacation. I was back home on vacation and, um, Bob, uh, had one of his, um, his dinners that he has where he has yeah, his, yeah. His from. and um i remember um he said you got to meet uh, my buddy glenn morshire said you know who he is yeah i know who glenn morshire is I'm watching everything is that's aaron pierce from 24. he's like would you <laughs> like to meet him i said heck yeah i want to meet him and uh end up meeting glenn and we're talking forever and that's when i was talking to glenn about um acting passion I said yeah we we're little kids um always grounded all the time but uh my mom gave us a <laughs> a VHS camera camcorder record. So we would reenact scenes from movies on our little camera. And then we'd go back and, and watch our work when, when my mom got home. That's awesome. And yeah. I got bit by the acting bug at a young age. And then I told Glenn, I says, yeah, when I'm done playing football, I really want to transition into acting. And then he gave me the lay of the land, like, you know, the actual reality behind um, acting. And he says, you know, there's a lot of parallels between acting and football. You're going to have a lot of monotony, a lot of dog days, a lot of long hours, repetition, and I looked at him and I said, oh, that's training camp. Yeah, okay, sign me up. I'm ready to go. And then he also said, you're going to have to totally lose yourself and rebuild it because you don't want to carry your football persona into acting because acting and football are different where you have to be an active listener. Um, you have to be in touch with your emotions and you have to be willing to, to do things that most people would not do or not feel comfortable doing. And um, wow. I mean, he was, he was spot on uh, yeah. the, those days of, you know, just being on set, repetition, um, acting is a lot different from football because in football you have that physical uh, cathartic release where you get to tackle people and hit them and you know in, in acting you don't get the, uh, the 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 reward right away you have to to wait for the, the finished product to be shown to the people and then you have to you know wait for people to give the response on how they viewed your work so it's a little bit different in that aspect but uh, Glenn was a great teacher he's a great teacher his, his class was phenomenal taught me a lot of uh, life lessons uh, how to be a better uh, father husband actor all in one. Glenn is is one of the most incredible human beings on planet Earth. It, and I, I like I told he called me the other night. It was 12, 15 in the morning and I answer and he's like, you know, I just got finished telling my wife that I didn't call girls I dated in high school as much as I call you. <laughs> I said, dude. What? I said, yeah, my wife's going to start one or what the heck's going on here, Glenn. So um, I love, I love, he's like a brother. I, that guy is incredible. I mean, just absolutely incredible. And what a great mentor to have to enter the next phase of your career. So, so you, you, uh, you got into acting. Oh uh, yeah, definitely. Um, as soon as I finished uh, playing football in 2014, I actually had a buddy, uh, my buddy Duke worked uh, for hydraulics and, um, Colin and Greg Strauss, uh, their brother Strauss were, were uh, directors for, for film. Yeah. And I went there for a year to intern with them and behind the camera, behind the scenes, just learning about production, lighting, gaffing, um, rigging, things like that. Just learning the whole business uh, as a whole so I could become more well-rounded actor because I, I love to be familiar with uh, my environment being on set. It's much like playing football. Love you too, Bob. Um, being on set is much like being on the football field. You have to know where the end zone is, the sideline, know the rules of the game before you play and, and be productive. So I wanted right. to take a year just to learn more about the business to not only just um, become more aware of my surroundings, but also just to make sure that I'm doing everything I need to do to be the best actor I can be. And um, my buddy Duke was uh, really uh, monumental in, in helping me learn that uh, backside of the camera and in, in the business. And then uh, also with Glenn, I was able to learn how to be a better actor so I can uh, harness the, the powers and gifts that I had and use them to my advantage. So it was, uh, I, I had a great team. I, I'm, all throughout my life, I always had a great team. It's not, nothing I've done has ever been on my own. Uh, and when I met my wife, I told her uh, uh, when I first saw her, first time I said to her, I'm going to marry you. And uh, she was saying the same thing to her friends, but you know, you know, um, when we, we got married, we had our first child and uh, our first child we lost um, in the womb at eight months. Uh, she had a center abruption 
and uh, it was a rough time. Man. And if not for our strong faith in God, it would be really tough to get through that because it's not something that you're expecting. And um, at, at the beginning of the, when that first happened, kind of threw me for, for a loop. And I was kind of first time in my life, I didn't have a plan and I wasn't listening to, to God fully. You know, I was uh, picking up drinking. I was drinking a lot and kind of in my own wallow and self-pity. And, you know, this is my life and uh, sort of wasn't doing what I should have been doing, which was uh, rallying behind my wife, uh, supporting her, showing her strength, uh, being there for her emotionally. And I didn't know how to be there for her emotionally. I was lashing out. I was angry. Um, um, not that I was blaming her. It's right. more that I just I was blaming myself. Like, what did I do in my life? Something I did back in my life. I'm trying to go through do a self audit. What did I do to deserve losing my child? And when I met Bob, Bob told me about uh, his daughter Macy, and yeah. um, it, it was it was it was you know good for me. I was like, you know, this is why Bob's in my life. Bob was there because he went through it. And and yeah. if I listen to Bob. I'll know how to deal with it better. And he taught me how to deal uh, with the emotions, how to power through it, how how to give power to the experience I had. And coupled with Glenn Morshower, I was talking to Glenn about it. And Glenn says, you know, that's something that you're going to always have with you for the rest of your life. And you should use that for your power. That's there with you. He's like, as you're acting, what's your motivation? So, uh, you know, my family, I want to I want to show my family that this is something that I'm doing and I'm passionate about. It's a it's a area where I can, you know, be myself, but also be somebody else at the same time. And Glenn taught me how to use those emotions to to feel what the passion desire is for what you want to do in life. And I remember um, me and Bob had a scene in, in uh, Bob Glenn's acting class where we, uh, you know, address the issue of, of losing a child and, and loss mm. and how to power through. And I, I remember that being a turning point in, in me showing me, they always say, you know, to an actor, hey, what's your process? And then for me, that became my process is remembering my family, remembering my wife, remembering those emotions we had, I remember losing my child and taking that and, being emotionally raw and allowing the universe to say somebody needs to hear a lesson that you're going to tell through your, your acting. So acting is storytelling. Yeah. So you go be a vessel. Let me be that vessel to show somebody how to power through. Cause I never want to be like a action hero. Yeah. You know, I played football long enough. That was fun. You know, beating your head, you know, you've been a, a gladiator for a long time. Now what can I do on the emotional side of it to sort of help somebody power through something? Somebody's going through something in life. How can you be a, a um, you know, a beacon of light for them. And I remember uh, Bob saying, Bob told me one time, he's like, you know what? You're going to be good, man. Just don't worry. You just keep being you and you're going to be good because you is enough. And I remember that that's always stuck with me. Bob's always told me that. He's like, you know, yeah. you, the, you know, you be a better self for you because the next level always demands a better, a better version of yourself. Yeah. And I mean, I, I've tried to stick to that uh, for, you know, going on, I don't know how many years, 39 years in this world, just trying to be a better, better version of myself. So, uh, wow, man. Um, and I, you know what? I could literally sit here for hours. In fact, Bob was on with, with Glenn Morshower and me the other night on, we, we get on and, and, and I mean, honestly, Glenn and I'll get on and then other people jump in. Bob was in with us the whole time. Um, and we'll have other people jump on and we do these live streams just talking about what's going on in the world and bringing hope and inspiration and, and um dude you're invited you need to be on there with us oh man anytime i would i would love to be those guys are yeah it's it, it, I, we we had you know you know how the conversations go it just goes uh, around. Listen, you know it's 1 a.m in the morning oh i know yeah, it's, or it's, three how about 3 a.m in the morning the other definitely. night i was like wow. the amount of knowledge that comes from from bob and glenn to me like they've wow. been powerful mentors um my father where there wasn't a, a father figure growing up. My mother had to do both jobs. And to stress a woman like that from four kids, being a mom and a dad, is tough work. And I remember when I first met Bob, Bob's like a, he's just that that the beacon of light. He's a good, good person. And anytime Bob asks him to do anything, I always say yes. I have to because I just know that it's gonna be a good reward in it. I mean maybe it's selfish or maybe you know it's just like you know there's always a feel good moment when you know yeah. Bob says hey would you mind doing this for sure of course you know and he gets a chance to, to meet people like yourself and wow. it's like um, Bob's never led me astray 
probably would have been one of the 12 disciples if he was back in the day, if he was that old. <laughs> He's definitely a disciple, man. Definitely. Bob is Bob is amazing. And I, I told him that, I, I mean, I, I've said it many times. I have met more amazing people because of Bob Denell than anybody ever has introduced me to. I can, I can second that. Uh, the guy is incredible. He's also so, a good marriage counselor too. <laughs> is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, me and my wife had a couple of rough spots, and you know, hey Bob, can you can you come over and help out? You know, and I hate to put you in the middle of this, but we need an <laughs> unbiased opinion. We're both at odds right now. We need somebody to be in the middle, the mediator, great mediator, because he comes in right away. He says, "Look," he tells my wife, "The Claudine, I'm not on Kasim's side. Kasim, I'm not on your side. I'm not on her side. I'm in the middle. So I'm going to give you the, the the answers straight from the middle. I love you both evenly." It's just that hey, I'm going to give it to you straight and, and how it is. And he's always the person who just gives it to you how it is. Bob was on his way to Columbus, Ohio, where I'm from. Go Bucks! <laughs> <laughs> I had to, man. <laughs> but but you know, and we were doing we were doing a we were going to do a next level uh, pop up dinner here in Columbus, mm -hmm. and um, and that's when this whole thing struck with COVID, and 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 we had to postpone it but it's going to come up uh, it's, it's going to happen soon but um so so listen it, the so you have and i i thought i saw have you been in some films you've been in some uh, yes yes uh, i was in um skyline it's a sci-fi movie uh beyond yeah. skyline and also i uh, did it i just recently it was um my first um production credit uh, i was the executive producer for a movie called the cycles path it was a little horror film um okay and then uh, the last film I just did is a movie called 420. Uh, it's a funny little uh, comedy, comedy movie about the the holiday 420. They're trying to you know make a holiday. But um, one of my buddies from my acting class, from a Glenn Morshaw acting class, actually my buddy Noah Noah Applebaum, and his uh, his girlfriend Terry uh, Fru, uh, Fruchanchi were the directors of it. And he told me he's like, hey, we'll love to have you in this comedy. I, I know you have a lot of people that uh, are, are following you, and, and you have a lot of kids that are mentored. But it's like I love you. Just bear with me for a moment. He's like. I know you're not a huge cannabis guy, but this is a funny comedy, and I think you have opportunity to sort of uh, springboard yourself as a comedian, and we'd love to have you part of this film. So, okay, I read the script, and it was probably one of the funniest scripts I've ever read in my life. And Really? Yeah. So I said, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm in. And ended up doing the film. It was the most fun I've ever had on set in my entire life. I, I've never, I didn't think that work could be, that, that could be work. I mean, it was from you know six a.m. to about nine o'clock at night, but it was nonstop laughter, fun, it was jokes, serious moments where you know serious moments were still fun. Yeah. But I mean, it was just overall the probably the best experience I've ever had in in Hollywood to this day. Have Have you done any motivational speaking? Uh yes, I have. Yeah, I was going to uh, say that that's that's got to be your next big career move, man. You need to be a motivational speaker full time. Yeah, I, I had a, um, a foundation. Um, my, my good friend Steve Haynes, before he passed away, he was the uh, president of my foundation when I was playing in the NFL. Wow. And um, it was called Athletes for Education. And we were the second largest foundation behind Junior Seau when I was in San Diego. Wow. And he reached a lot of kids, a lot of lives, did a lot of, lot, of, lot of positive things, a lot of fun things. And one of my favorite things was uh, going to speak to the, the children and the youth. And I remember... Um, I remember we were in North County, San Diego, yeah. at I think it was Delmar High School, and I know one of the one of the volunteers asked me, "Why are you at this school? Uh, these kids don't need your help. You know, the kids in, in Southeast San Diego, the ones in the in the poor community, those are the ones that need your help." And I was like, "No, you have been mistaken. Every kid needs to contribute to society as a whole because the kids here that you would consider to have a privilege need to understand it's important to give back as well. So not only do they need to understand that it's important to give back." They need to also see what it's like on the other side so that they don't feel entitled, that they do appreciate their, their privilege that they have. Wow. And they can see that the people on the other side are not beneath them, but they're just not afforded the same luxuries that they had growing up. So I had this a mentorship program where I would take kids from Southeast San Diego and kids from North County, and I'd bring them together, and they would study together. And after studying, we sit around in a circle, and they would talk about their their lives, like their, their family life growing up, what their experiences are, what their um, – their weaknesses, their strengths, um, things they're worried about, things they're scared about. And I remember one of the kids um, from Del Mar High School was saying that, you know, my father's an alcoholic and my mother works too much. So I'm often left at my house uh, by myself to my own you know, demise. 
and you know, an item mind is the devil's workshop. So yeah. I'm the kid saying, you know, I just, I want my, I want my dad to get better and I want to see, I miss my mom. And I remember one of the kids from Southeast uh, tapping one of the counselors on the shoulder saying, man, that, that happened to me too. I, I, how did, how does it happen there? I thought they were rich. I thought everything was good with them. And he's like, no, you have to understand these life problems are bigger than money. It's bigger than status. These are, these are socioeconomic, emotional problems that are something that it, it has to, has to be addressed all throughout the, uh, the, the community, whether you're rich or you're poor, everybody wants love. I mean, yep. love is something that we all, we all crave. And, you know, whether you're living paycheck to paycheck or you, you know, you're living uh, luxurious, all yep. you want is love. And I, and the, these kids started to realize that. And I remember one of the kids uh, that was at the, uh, the Tucson mm -hmm. center, he was from the, uh, the, the homeless kids center. I brought him to one of the, uh, the sessions I had at La Jolla high school. And he said, man, this is great to see all these kids that are struggling with the same things I had, like bullying and, and they're scared to, to, you know, show how smart they are. Or there's a girl I like, but I don't think she likes me because I have acne. You know, saying things that you worry about as, as a high school kid. Yeah. I showed them. I never get them and telling them that like, you guys, you know, I grew up in the gang of fest neighborhood. I was a nerd. I got straight A's. I loved it. Mm -hmm. I was proud of it. I was a guy that was the jock who would defend the nerds that were getting picked on in school. And said, because I had who I was to me was more important than what other people thought of me. And wow. I said, and that's the main thing was that, once you start loving yourself, you get power from that. It doesn't matter if you have money or not. The right. fact that you love yourself and you're in touch with yourself, people gravitate towards that. And you can become whatever you want to be as long as you love yourself first. And that was one of the, the messages I tried to preach to the kids a lot was that, you know, put yourself first and love yourself. And then, you know, you'll see that doors open up because people want to help the person that's helping themselves. So, so man, you're like, uh, wow, I, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away. Uh, so, Bob, thank you so much, man, for introducing me to Kasim. So, Kasim, what 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 is um, what's going on now? What do what are you up to these days besides being in lockdown? <laughs> oh man, if you could hear it right now, these kids are going crazy upstairs. <laughs> my my wife has been my my wife is awesome, man. She's my rock. Yeah, um, I love my wife to death. Me and my wife are polar opposites. I mean, the other day we we're in quarantine and we're sitting on the couches, and she's like you're just always on your phone. Like you can't sit still and just you know, talk to me and, and be present and hang out. I was like, I can, but the way my brain works is that I have to multitask. Right. I have to be like the TV has to be on and I can be talking to you. I have to have the radio playing and I'm doing homework. Uh, <laughs> it's just always something I have to have like multiple things going on. I said, because I'm just used to that, like the crowd noise and then focusing on the quarterback, giving the play call. And I remember uh, she telling me, she's like, if you can give me your focus and attention, you just give it one hour. You can go have four hours on your own. So uh, right right now she's she's wrangling the kids upstairs and keeping them away so that I could have peace down here. But I, I know once I'm done here, she's like, okay, here's the kids. The kids are yours. How many kids do you guys have? Uh, we have uh, two kids, a uh, boy and a girl, uh, a three-year-old and, uh, and, and a one-year-old. One-year-old and two-year-old. She'll be uh, three um, in two weeks. Wow. But, uh, yeah, they're a handful. They're, oh, they're yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I'm double-duty double daddy daycare along <laughs> with my wife. So it's <laughs> – Quarantine has been fun. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, what outside of quarantine are you, are you, what are you, what are you doing? Like, are you doing anything right now? And are, um, for me, just, um, I've been trying to work on a new script, uh, trying to do this, uh, this new movie coming out. So I'm waiting for the 420 to launch, uh, actually launched on 420, um, of this, uh, of this month. And we're actually putting together another script and another budget. So we're trying to shoot another film. There's another film I want to do. It's an anti-bullying film. And uh, it's, got, it's got a powerful message about um, bullying, you know, self-love, self-identity. You know, the people who, this this movie is going to target the bullies to let them know that it's okay to not be a bully. It's okay to love yourself and love the people that you think are different from you. They're actually the same, and there's a lot of similar qualities in that you're bullying because there's something you're lacking. So it's like a, a self-realization type movie. But I, I think it's a it's time to move on to that, like the next message to, to share with the world. So I'll, one of my uh, brothers was telling me, he's like, you know, I should just, you know, do, do the movies like The Rock, you know, you can, you're a big guy, you know, go do an action film and thing like that. But for me, it's more about telling a story and, and, and helping somebody reach out to people who need to hear. I love those movies where like, you know, man, I need, I really need to see that. You know, I really need to hear that positivity. Wow. Dude, that, is that your wife? Yeah, yeah. I think the kids are driving their nuts upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> hey, tell her she can pop on and say hi. If you yeah. want. Love to meet her. Here we go. Here's a little one here. Hey. 
Say hi. <laughs> He's like, what is going on here? Yeah, deer in headlights. He's like, this is what I've been getting held upstairs for. <laughs> uh, it's adorable. So, so, cause Sam, I, I don't want to keep you all day. I'm sure your wife is, is at, at her breaking point. Now. <laughs> so listen, I genuinely want to thank you. I appreciate you for coming on, sharing your story, your hope. Um, everybody should definitely be following you on your, your Facebook page, right? You've got the, oh, yes, sir. yeah. Um, any, anywhere else are you, are you active on Instagram or? Uh, yeah. Instagram, uh, I'm Instagram, uh, Kasim Osgood, and uh, Twitter, Kasim Osgood, 81. Okay. Yep. Dude, thank you so much for coming yeah. on and your <laughs> inspiration. Hope what you're doing for kids. Yeah, there's uh, the other one. She wanted to say hi. Hold on. Let's let's go. Yeah. Hi. Hi. How are you? Okay. What, what's your name? What's your name? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry? Kalea. Kalea. Kalea? Yeah, I brought my dollies. Uh, is that a unicorn? Yeah. Aww. She's the unicorn princess. I'm a unicorn princess. I got my stuff and, and, and brush. Aww. <laughs> She's adorable. She's awesome. She's going to be the talker. My, wow. son's more the, my son's more the mover and shaker, and she's the talker. They're, they're a good one-two punch. <laughs> That's awesome. Kasim, thank you so much. Enjoy your family. Y'all stay safe. And if there's anything I can ever do for you, I'm here, man. Any Anything. So. Oh, yeah. It's it a pleasure meeting you. I appreciate the platform and the, and the, the time. It was, uh, it was a gift for me. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks, Bob, for the introduction as well. And whenever you guys are on those, uh, those 1 a.m. Uh, talks, then let me know. Dude, I, I'm <laughs> – what's your wife say? No, I'll know yeah, you not. Yeah. <laughs> no, so he was saying that Bob, uh, Glenn, and uh, him uh, get on and they're just talking for oh, forever, you know, just five. So, yeah, we'll definitely. Guy time. <laughs> I've got your cell phone. I'll just text you and say, hey, I'm going to email you the link or something. Dude, okay, for sure. you're awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Y'all, seriously, stay safe in this crazy time. And, and definitely, you too. Keep that faith. That's awesome. I love it. Definitely. I love it. All right. Th I'm going to end that. Don't hang up on me yet. I'm going to end the live stream. Thank you all for sharing and watching. And, and Kasim, thank you again for sharing your story. All right. Thank you. Awesome.